Death of the Author, Part 1. What Barth Said We are now beginning to let ourselves be fooled no longer by the arrogant, antifrastical recriminations of good society, in favor of the very thing it sets aside, ignores, smothers, or destroys. We know that to give writing its future, it is necessary to overthrow the myth. The birth of the reader must be at the cost of the death of the author. Roland Barth, The Death of the Author, 1967 all your head cannons are valid, heart emoticon. Roland Barth, The Death of the Author, 1967. No joke, I love this tweet. I think it's beautiful. It distills everything about the way the phrase The Death of the Author is used in contemporary media discourse so elegantly I can't help but love it. Um, even though I am actually really, really frustrated by the way that the phrase death of the author is used in contemporary media discourse, which is what I wanted to talk about in this video. And that's not a dig at this random person on Twitter. They're by no means the only person to use the phrase in this way. And honestly, I don't even have enough context to know how sincerely they mean this statement and all that it implies. And like, if you're watching this and thinking to yourself, but isn't that kind of what death of the author means? Then this isn't a dig at you either. This isn't a video about shaming people for being wrong. This is a video about meaning and how it's constructed. And so I wanted to start by approaching this tweet as a text to be read independently of the author's background. Now, the first thing that I wanna bring up, and I know this may seem pedantic, but bear with me is the attribution of this statement to Barth. Now, obviously I understand that this is a joke tweet, one that I find pretty damn funny to be honest, and I do understand that the attribution is an essential component to the joke. Like, without it, it's just some random person saying all your headcanons are valid, right? But that's kind of the point that I wanted to make, which is that when people use the phrase death of the author in this way, what they're often trying to say is, my headcanon is valid, which is kind of a dead end for a conversation about media analysis, right? But if instead you use the phrase death of the author, you're conjuring into the conversational space the specter of Roland Barth, conveniently dead esteemed philosopher as an appeal to authority, which is somewhat ironic given the context because my headcanon is valid is a statement against authority, and yet in order to justify that statement, you have to appeal to the authority of Roland Barth? But setting aside the logical fallacy of an appeal to authority, the question remains, is this an accurate assessment of what Barth said? Which is actually a really interesting question, which in this case centers on the word valid. Like, in online discourse, valid is commonly used to basically acknowledge individual experience or identity and indicate that one accepts, if not celebrates it, as part of the world in which we live. In which case, yeah, Barth did kind of say that. In a much more nuanced, specific, considered sort of way, but yeah. But valid is also a term of assessment, right? Like an argument is or is not valid depending on the stability of the logic that upholds it. And claiming that Barth is arguing in this essay that your headcanon, regardless of the ways that it disregards the text it's referencing, is valid in this sense, is as demonstrably false as saying, baby eating is good actually, Jonathan Swift, a modest proposal. And it's the conflation of these two uses of the word valid that leads to statements like this. I think death of the author kind of exists, but the fact of the matter is, death of the author doesn't account for things that are stated in text. Any kind of analysis done on text should be supported with evidence from those texts. Anything else is nonsensical projection. Another beautiful tweet that I found while scouring the internet for this video. Like, again, not dunking on this person. They are responding to the way that death of the author is used and not the actual text that it's referencing. Which is wild to me. Like, it's wild. Because this person's critique of death of the author is that it validates countertextual interpretations when that itself is a countertextual interpretation of Barth's essay. Like, 
that's where this discourse has landed, which is why I'm making this video. <laughs> I did find one person on Twitter who was actually asking for an explanation of the text and the responses were actually good faith attempts to engage in a dialogue on the subject. It happens. But all of their explanations basically came down to Barth is arguing that meaning is created by the reader regardless of what the author intends. And there's just like one tiny minuscule little problem with that, which is that Barth isn't talking about authorial intent. Like, he's not. No, 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 wait. Before anyone starts quoting text at me, I am aware that he discusses it. But he's discussing it in the context of what the act of writing entails, not in the sense that it is the force of oppression that our new liberatory ideology will overthrow. And while I think his language may overstep in some ways that invite misinterpretation by stating things like succeeding the author the scripter no longer bears within him passions humors feelings impressions but rather this immense dictionary from which he draws a writing that can know no halt a it's still a misinterpretation because b barth is ultimately comparing the role of a scripter to that of the myth of the author the author as an individual actor is not the subject of Barth's critique, but rather the institutions of power that uphold the myth of the author at the expense of all else. And this idea of the author at the time of Barth's writing is being pushed primarily not by individual authors themselves, but by the institutions of literary criticism. It's the myth of the great man artist. Leonardo da Vinci, Michelangelo, Rembrandt, Vincent van Gogh, Pablo Picasso, Chris Burden. It's an approach to literary criticism that utilizes an author's biography as a sort of skeleton key to unlocking the true meaning of a work of art. As Barth writes, the image of literature to be found in ordinary culture is tyrannically centered on the author, his person, his life, his tastes, his passions, while criticism still consists for the most part in saying, Baudelaire's work is the failure of Baudelaire the man, Van Gogh's his madness, Tchaikovsky's his vice. The explanation of a work is always sought in the man or woman who produced it, as if it were always in the end, through the more or less transparent allegory of the fiction, the voice of a single person, the author, confiding in us. So in contemporary discourse, rejecting the author's biographical history outright leads to some disquieting assertions, shall we say. Like, do we read Mel Gibson's Passion of the Christ neutrally without recognition of his known anti-Semitism? Moreover, does that anti-Semitism play a role in the way that meaning con is constructed in the film? I would argue that it absolutely does, and that the contemporary experience of celebrity makes it exceedingly difficult to bring ourselves to the work without that knowledge and framing. However, in 1967, this sort of biographical analysis was, as Barth says, tyrannical and in its tyranny limited our understanding and appreciation of art in ways that damaged audiences by rendering our individual experiences insignificant, but it also damaged the artists themselves by limiting their ability to create outside of their own personal history. This often harmed marginalized artists in particular with their work being read solely through the lens of their marginalized identity. So take for example, Tennessee Williams and Edward Albee, two canonized white male American playwrights who late in their careers were outed as being gay. Literary analysts at the time jumped at this new to them biographical information and immediately began rereading all of their works as queer allegories, imposing this reading on the text in ways that defy logic. In Albie's case, this led to all male performances of his arguably most famous work, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf? But as Albie himself said at a talk that I attended in undergrad, while straight and gay couples do share a lot of experiences in common, hysterical pregnancies are not often one of them. This is a play about two straight couples, about the dynamics between the four of them, what each represents to the others, and yes, a false pregnancy, and how that experience fractured the relationship between the two main characters, George and Martha. Performing it with an all-male cast is imposing Albie's queerness onto the play in a way that disregards the text and 
reduces the scope of Albie's voice to his queerness. He found it offensive. And so he brandished the power of his estate to shut these productions down. Responding to this tyranny of an author's biography to a tyranny of authorial intent. And while Albie is rightly criticized for his censorious response, it should be noted that the type of analysis that he was responding to is also bad and damaged countless other marginalized artists from George O'Keefe to Jasper Johns and Robert Rauschenberg. And that type of analysis is precisely what Barth is pushing against in Death of the Author. So to interpret this essay as though Barth is laying down the law, forbidding us from ever bringing the life of an author into the reading of a text is to apply to him a new kind of tyrannical intent. Like, he's not saying you can never do this, and if you do, you're bad and wrong and should be mocked and ridiculed. Like, he's saying that the this way that we've been doing things excludes and ignores a huge part of the experience of art, and in doing so, upholds systems of power that deserve scrutiny. It's a revolutionary essay for fuck's sake. Reading it without the context of what it's responding to is just nonsensical. Like, how do you read Marx without the context of capitalism? <laughs> But okay, so he's responding to this tyranny of the myth of the author. So what is he proposing? Kind of nothing. Because he's not really being prescriptive, he's being descriptive. He's saying this is how it is. And how is it? Well, pause. That's informed by Barth's earlier work on semiotics and sign. Basically, he says that meaning is constructed through a dialogue. A stop sign, for example, creates its meaning through a dialogue between the signifier, the object of the stop sign, and the signified, the command to stop. Or, a little more abstractly, a photograph of a tree is the signifier. The signified is the idea of a tree, which is a very complicated concept if you stop and think about it. Pointing to and complicating this relationship with the artifice of the signifier is exactly what this painting is doing. In Death of the Author, Barth applies a similar understanding of the construction of meaning to art. Art is a dialogue between the author and the reader. Meaning is created through this dialogue and cannot be separated from it. So the tradition of lit literary criticism that tried to decipher meaning by essentially psychoanalyzing the author ignores the fundamental purpose of any artistic endeavor, which is to reach an audience. And while Barth isn't being prescriptive, we can extrapolate from his writing and point to a type of criticism that respects the nature of this relationship. And that form of criticism is necessarily extremely focused on the text itself, because that is the only concrete evidence that we have for the dialogue. Which is why this tweet is so wild to me. <laughs> because this is what Barth says about a reader's relationship to a text. Thus is revealed the total existence of writing. A text is made of multiple writings, drawn from many cultures and entering into mutual relations of dialogue, parody, contestation. But there is one place where this multiplicity is focused, and that place is the reader, not, as was hitherto said, the author. The reader is the space on which all the quotations that make up a writing are inscribed without any of them being lost. A text's unity lies not in its origin, but in its destination. So it's also wild to me that people treat death of the author as though it's a thing to be applied or not applied, agreed with or disagreed with, depending on context. Like, okay, if you think that death of the author means that countertextual interpretations are every bit as legitimate as textual ones, then fine, okay, whatever, but like, you're not applying or agreeing with Barth. That's not what he's saying. He's describing a phenomenon whereby meaning is arrived at through dialogue. Okay. That dialogue is between the author and the reader. And the language of art that is being used to bridge that gap is fundamentally an imperfect translation of what's in the author's head, working in the context of the reader's head in a way that is fundamentally ungovernable by the will of the author. And like, if you want to disagree with that, you better bring a better analysis to the table. Because... 
I don't know what that would be. Like, I personally have never lived in a world where I can directly implant my thoughts into someone else's head. Sometimes I wish I could. But I also really enjoy the messiness of the phenomenon that Barth describes. I think it's expansive and pluralistic. And it's fluid and fascinating. And reigning in that process feels bleak and authoritative to me. Because, guess what? I think Barth is right. I think he's right. I think you I think he got it. I think he nailed it. I think what he describes, this phenomenon of creating meaning through dialogue comports with reality as I have experienced it. And trying to bend reality to one's will is an attempt to exert power in an authoritative way. It imposes limits on human experience that are impossible to achieve, and so in striving to achieve them, one must rely on authoritative means. I think that's bad. And that's why the misreading of this essay is frustrating enough for me to make this video about. Like, I'm not interested in defending Barth's reputation from the ravages of time because I think he's untouchable and should never be questioned or something. Like, no, this essay means a lot to me because it's a radical text that opened the world of art up to the masses instead of keeping meaning locked away behind gatekeeping institutions of power. And it means a lot to me because as an artist and an art reader and an art critic, Barth is describing the nature of those relationships accurately. Which is why, loath though I may be to do so, I have to admit that the meaning of the phrase death of the author has changed. And the fact that it's changed is further evidence that Barth was right. Because if I accept Barth's analysis, which I do, then I have to accept that the contemporary usage of the phrase death of the author is part of its meaning. Now, it's not one that I agree with, both in the sense that it's countertextual and in the sense that I think it represents a new kind of tyranny of the reader. But it is one that I have to contend with. If I use the phrase death of the author, the meaning I intend, that which I've tried to outline here, is not likely to be the meaning that is understood. No, what's likely to be understood is this. All your headcanons are valid. And I don't know what to do with that except make YouTube videos about why I think that's bad. So that's it for now. Thank you for watching. Uh, I hope you liked it. Um, if you did like it, please like and subscribe and, uh, you know, comment and stuff. Keep the dialogue going. And, uh, yeah, you can send me money on Patreon if you want. Um, I will be doing rewards for, you know, names and credits and stuff like that. Uh, and yeah, stay tuned for part two, Authorial Intent, where I know I'll at least be discussing two artists who loom pretty large over this discourse. Okay, thanks. Bye. 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 Marcel?